Breeze. Let's get into this with Connor Tomlinson. He is the policy director of the British Conservation Alliance. Connor, you're very welcome to Talk Radio this morning. Good morning, Peter. Thank you very much for having me. I've seen you on a couple of times, Connor, and I just want to say you have very impressive hair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that, that caught me off guard, but uh, well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's gravity defying at best. It is. It is gravity defying. I know many middle-aged women who pay lots of money for that kind of volume. Um, listen, uh, Connor, on to more important uh, topics. COP twenty six. Um, do you think this is uh, going to be a success? Do you think an agreement is going to be reached? Is it, in fact, inevitable that an agreement is going to be reached, and will it make any difference? Well, like quite a few of your viewers on the run up to COP twenty six, I was calling it flop twenty six as well, because despite we at the British Conservation Alliance hosting with a wide variety of partners like the Conservative Environment Network, ACC, you know, like people across from America and Australia, we host the Youth Environment Summit. And the reason we get to do that is because in the halls of government and the halls of the UN and the Green Zone, the Blue Zone, etc., all these places I couldn't get into without a vaccine passport, um, they weren't having a conversation about involving the market particularly. They had a few showtime demonstrations, but that was only with the people that they'd either given subsidies or grants to. So they excluded a lot of the pro-capitalist side of the argument, which are exactly the kind of people that could innovate our way out of this mess. And that's the reason the deal is actually being obstructed. I'd put money on the reason the deal not going through being Article 6 of the Paris Accords not being able to be agreed upon. Now, that's the article which ratifies the Paris Accords um, and it creates global carbon markets. So it allows you to trade based on carbon and, and that creates free trade agreements like ACTS and, you know, builds provisions into the TPP and the kind of thing that we were negotiating with Australia with the Adam Smith Institute, who I did a paper with, great organisation. Uh, I think a lot of the countries that are meant to be involved in this, like China and Russia, you might as well write the agreement in Martian because they don't understand the language of markets properly other than to exploit them and the ignorance of the West. Over there, of course, the only people that make any money are those that are tied to the government or who've got their family members related to the Kremlin. And China, so and, Russia, global... China and Russia, of course, not even at uh, their leaders anyway, their presidents yes, not, exactly. not even at COP26. So, I mean, two of the world's biggest polluters who aren't even involved at, at the, the highest level with this. Yeah, and obviously with, they didn't sign up. I know China definitely didn't, India didn't, uh, Australia and the US curious didn't sign up to the 2040 pact that said we're going to abandon coal. Now, I understand that obviously we can't ditch fossil fuels entirely in the transition period. I actually went to the world, uh, the Britain's largest wind farm, uh, Whitley, and we spoke to the people who were running the wind farm and they said, even they said, okay, the government hasn't really spoken to us very well, but we do need some sort of baseline, be it nuclear or carbon captured natural gas, as we transition to where renewables have enough battery storage and enough generation capacity to make 100% renewables grid. This, this, is, this is the question that so many people ask me, Connor, and you know, this mm. is going around so much. If we have so many electric cars, if we have so many things based on electric, where does the energy come from for mm. those? And COP doesn't seem to be engaging with that particularly. It doesn't seem to be gauging where the batteries come from either. I mean, we just lost a massive lithium deposit out in Afghanistan thanks to Biden's terrible foreign policy. And now China makes 80% of the batteries. So unless we switch to hydrogen, which a lot of people have been going for, I know I spoke on the train home, funnily enough, with a guy who's building hydrogen-powered AI boats and trucks for the, uh, the shipping industry, which is a really interesting idea. But it's obviously quite volatile. You've got to have a lot of safety precautions. It's very expensive. So if we're going to make a lot of battery-powered cars and battery-powered grid, we did some figures on this, and it would take from now until 2028, the whole world's battery capacity to stop go straight to the uk it costs 2.9 trillion and even then we'd only have 27 percent of consumer demand so the battery capacity isn't there it's far too expensive it's made by countries who hate us and the renewables can't generate that yet so we need to have some more sensible market-based policy to meet our 2050 targets so do you think cop 26 ignored the very basis of many of the countries that are part of it the capitalistic free market system well, I think actually a lot of the politicians in these countries have, have ignored it because we spoke to some of the MPs and I don't wish to disparage them showing up. I mean, we had uh, Canada's shadow environment minister, we had uh, Sally and Hart, etc. A lot of really brilliant people who are very informed on this basis. And unanimously, when they were questioned on, oh, okay, how about we use tax cuts instead of subsidies and spending? And that way we can get around, for example, when uh, the African countries said, oh, we need some climate funding. Um, those guys are going to use that climate funding, no doubt, to buy into China's Belt and Road Scheme to build up their infrastructure because it's the cheapest one and Chinese just import all their labor so they don't get any work in that country etc rather than that if we do supply side tax cuts for the companies who are building this stuff they'd be able to go across the border and, and build it up around the world and also develop it here and all the politicians just went oh we never thought about tax cuts we only thought about say uh, spending and subsidies and tax raises and I was sitting there thinking well you guys are meant to be conservatives have you really not thought about tax cuts how far off the reservation have you strayed and that's why in the halls of government we're seeing such big spending and, and all of the people who are thinking about you know market innovations were relegated to our fringe event which was very successful but we'd rather have spoke to them in the actual green zone.
It's interesting as well, you talk about the uh, market-based solutions and the, you talk mm. about tax cuts and so on. Is there an almost, I mean, a number of people who uh, got in touch with Talk Radio talk about almost a, a religion around uh, climate, that there's almost a, a, a very clear ideology, the taxing, spending, telling people what they can't do is really the, the way to achieve net zero, the way to stop the climate, incre- uh, the uh, temperature increasing to, in the way that it is. I think... The problem has been that the right side of the argument, the pro-liberty side, the pro-market side, has ceded a lot of ground in recent years because the left goes so far off the reservation in terms of making the claim that the world's going to burn in 10 years, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Extinction Rebellion There are so many times when we just get this all the time. It's one minute to midnight. Mm. This is the last chance. And it seems my entire life people have been saying this, especially people like Prince Charles, for example, that, you know, this is the last possible chance. And, I mean, this is the 26th COP. There have been 25 other uh, COP conferences and, the, and you know we're still told this is the last chance and you know it, it's now or never essentially. Well it's clearly not the last chance because they planned the 27th in Egypt because <laughs> they all want to go away on a week in Sharm El Sheikh uh, I wouldn't mind that either but on, 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 that note, we've had a, on that note we've had a, a, a not exact note actually we've had a texter who says hi Peter COP26 was just the elite deciding how much the poor would pay uh, the rich to get richer now the jets have left and their parties are over it looks like plan b is on the cards for the rest of us i wonder what you make of that sentiment uh i think that's unfortunately true i did a piece in the american spectators saying will more eco-authoritarianism come from cop 26 and it seems a lot of the time that the governments are happy to control our spending i know mastercard and the world economic forum have proposed a credit card that caps uh, individual people's spending to their carbon footprint so you won't be able to use public transport or uh, buy a think, sorry hold on if, people vol- carbon footprint. people vol- voluntarily use a MasterCard, a, 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 a use a, a credit card that stops them from doing things, stops them from spending money. That is that is one of the policies proposed by that sort of private sector. And obviously, uh, a lot of people, policymakers and that, get their ideas from these unelected international bodies. So you can only be worried that, hey, they might think this is a good idea. They, they type things like, you know, smart meters or uh, AI-based transport that would calculate the exact amount of carbon footprint. All this data gathering about carbon usage is great, but as soon as it starts being made on restricted social that's policies, very like COVID, sinister. Example, that's very, I mean, it's, that, it's it, scary. It reminds me of the sort of social credit system in China, where exactly. you can only do certain and things and you build up credit by doing things the government wants you to do exactly and to tie that in as well with the idea that boris says we need to take action on cash um janet yellen the u.s treasury secretary says we need to tax unregulated capital gains uh, rishi sunak says about bitcoin so that it'd be a digital currency where nothing is outside of taxation and it could be inflated or scarily enough confiscated anytime they want the government is tying our financial systems our, our jobs uh, our ability for freedom of movement with you know transport and that to carbon and i think it's great to want energy independence but to have this ideology as you worded it of a zero carbon future especially when china aren't taking action on that they're building more coal-fired power plants and outdoing us 16 to 1 if we were to get to net zero um, on emissions then to have that would tank uh, the entire thing that makes Britain great, which is, you know, liberalism, um, a watch from the state and the freedom of, of movement, commerce and speech. Yeah. OK. Uh, Connor Tomlinson, Policy Director for the British Conservation Alliance. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Talk Radio this morning.